Welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Zita Smith. Zita is a bilingual Dutch poet and artist. Active as a performer since 2011, she is now doing a master's in theater at Hogeschool Zeit, focused on artistic research. Zita writes and performs eclectic installations of word and sound with a philosophical approach to humanity, its curses, and its possible cures. Take it away, Zita. Yay, Zita! Yay! <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for reading that. I forgot I wrote that, and I'm, I'm quite impressed by myself. <laughs> That's a good way to start. Uh, um, hi, I'm so, so happy to be here um, and to, well, to talk to you all. Um, uh, before I met Cheryl, I didn't really know a lot about transhumanism, so it has been quite a discovery um, these last few months to figure out what it is you all are doing. Um, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm quite intrigued by humans and our human behavior and you all work in a field that is about the next level and the next step. Um, I am with school as well, but I'm writing something that is called How to Human. So, how to be human. And if I apply this to a, a transhumanistic approach, something like this comes out. Puppets, flesh bags in a world of imagination, blobs of bone and marrow disguising what? A soul, maybe? A thought machine, an existential accident, a hoax, a sin, a sorrow, a problem and its own solution. Human. A definition. In the I, I find the self. The thing that makes us individual, that makes us unique. All of us are shaped by time. For some, it is shaped through divine intervention or quests to endure. For others, and I think most of us in the room, it is chance or luck even. The luck or the misfortune uh, of the timing and place of your birth, especially at what level of unrest you find it when you take your first breath. True peace does not exist, only temporary losing chaos. And that is where we find ourselves. In this chaos, I find the you. I recognize your entity as similar but foreign. I assume your inner workings are largely the same as mine, although I can never be sure. I could never listen to your thoughts. Can I? And if I could, if I could listen to all your thoughts, where would you end and I begin? Or should the goal be a hive mind? I've talked about this today before, where I is just as obsolete as you. Where is the boundary between you and I? And if we cross, like Alice through the looking glass, will we find ourselves lost or found? Imagine that you do not have a corporal experience. Take away my free will, and I could exist for eternity. Supply me with a purpose that I won't be able to question. That's interesting, why? Right? If we cannot question our purpose, then we take away the question, why? And I, I wouldn't need to, to answer it anymore. I wouldn't be thinking about that even. I'd be part of a whole. But that's the hive mind. We're not there yet. Right now, I do have a question. Uh, why do I exist? I am more afraid right now of eternal life than death. To exist and not feel the passing of time or where there is no end of time. It takes the why of life away. Or 
It takes away the why of the life I know now. The fact that we as humans have the ability to question this why makes it our most essential attribute. One we use and cultivate way too little, and which we allow too much external influence, and the one that is so essential to any notion of free will. Now, free will is quite an interesting statement. Does it even exist? I mean, we can talk about that as well. Um, but should that not be our collective goal then? Free will. Freedom and equal opportunity for all humans. I mean, I don't really believe in it. Can we truly not trust our species to do right? What you as an answer to that? Can we trust our species to do right? <coughs> when we research a transhumanistic future, let's keep our own humanity as an essential guideline. Because to find the beauty in the wrongs is a mighty task, but she is there. Lurking in the shadows of imperfection, mistakes and miscommunication, she resides in missed buses and genetic defects, in fallen branches and broken glass, ceiling or wine, in chance encounters and light bulb moments, in savant and master of the trade, between then and now, we exist constantly imperfect. This is our current human state, evolving, changing, and growing. And if we exist more stationary, whether digital, robotical, gene upgraded, cyborg, testicle, in the minds of fish or collectively powering our hive mind, we are different. We are altered. And therefore, it is essential to decide what to keep and what to let go. What is the essence of humanity or our thinking blob conundrum? For that thing once lost, we could never call ourselves human again. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It needs to be a conscious choice. I ask you not to allow government, institutions or the race to finish to cloud your choices. In this field, and in society in general, taking responsibility for your I, if you are influencing a you, is the only way to safeguard an us. So what morality, or what humanity, or what love do we teach? What do we keep, and what do we discard? Thank you. Thank you very much. I have many questions. <laughs> and I think you might as well have some of me. Is, is anything in this text that has raised any questions or concerns even? Or things you want to say? Please say them. So, concern would not be the word, but let's say, of course, it made me react when I heard, uh, I'm more afraid of eternal life than death, but that's, you were waiting for this, right, probably. <laughs> Here. So, uh, let's discuss about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, the interesting thing, because I've, 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 the, 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 the first um, uh, notion, or the first thing I think Charles said to me about it, it's yeah, it possible to never die again. And my thir first thought was, oh dear Lord, <laughs> then there's no end. Then why, I mean, then it's just, it's just a continuous, thinking about how life has been, it's just a continuous struggle and there's no end to it. And if I look at this from a humanic, hum humanistic point of view that I have now, it's terrible. I, 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 please let me die, please let me become 80 and die. But if I transport myself into a state, into a world that is better or more good, 
eternal life, it takes away something so essential to our human um, experience <laughs> that I wonder if you take away the death part of it, what is, what is human then, if we're not dying anymore? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, the first thing I thought was exactly the, the same point, uh, the, the, the reaction I had. But um, my answer uh, is different. Uh, for me, as a transhumanist, it's not at all about eternal life at all. Uh, I think that uh, there will always be reasons at different level uh, to die, um, to be in uh, one, two uh, hundred uh, years ago, or thousand, or ten thousand, or one billion years. But <laughs> there will be an end. Yes, there will be uh, an end. So that then I. My position is that question. The, the, the important thing is uh, just uh, wow. Uh, if we have uh, I don't know uh, uh, a thousand years, it's uh, it's already so huge that uh, such a thing, so a lot of things will, will change. Yeah. So already uh, we can try to, to protect ourselves in this perspective. It's not useful to uh, speak about it in our life. Who was first? I think you're right. So when you when you express that feeling that that sounded horrible to potentially not ever die, mm -hmm. the first thing that came to mind is, oh, are you thinking that you are doomed not to be able to die? As in the choice is being taken away. Right? Because all we're saying is maybe you get the opportunity to live longer if you wish to. It's kind of like the right to die. It's the same question, but on the other end. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, because then you touch on something that's very uh, current right now. It's the right to die. Do we have the right to die now? Of course you do. Uh, uh, let me say something here. Sorry, sorry, I have to, sorry. No, we don't. <laughs> and people die every moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not the and right. it depends on where you where you live in the world. It, you know, exactly. death with dignity. You have a right to die, etc. So that's government controlled and and religion mm -hmm. too. Institutions. But yes. What the comment I want to make is just based on what Mark just said and Randall, of course, and. The alignment here, alignment being the proper word for today, is that it's not binary. It's not life or death. The definition of death has changed over the eons. Mm -hmm. Remember at a time when a bell was, uh, Didier's bell was outside a grave? <laughs> and if someone, <laughs> they, if someone was buried and he or she or it or they were yes. semi-conscious and they woke up, come out, people were said to be dead that weren't dead and came back to life. Okay, bottom line is, the definition of death will continue to change. It has been changing, so that's no, no big news. But the option of partial death, alternative death, dropping out for a decade or two, coming back, all these options are available and possible in scenarios for yeah. the future. So if we get out of that life or death, and the other thing is the term immortality is used by many transhumans. I particularly do not use it because it reminds me of no exit. Who exactly. wants to live in no exit where you can't get out? Yeah. So I think death being optional or indefinite lifespan is, is philosophically better, maybe, for the, me. The interesting thing is that it's, it's, it's um, because it is about prolonging and uh, it's changing uh, something we've we've not been able to change for millennia and that's why it's an interesting way to approach it and for me personally I love the fact that there is an end to my suffering because sometimes I feel life is suffering um, but if I didn't experience my life as suffering would I still look at it the same way I'm not sure because I don't live that life right now <laughs> Yeah, I would like to add that I support um, an, the idea of an open lifespan. So mm -hmm. that means you can choose if you want uh, to stay alive, if you want to die, if you want to drop out and then back in. But maybe if I have a choice that is different from your choice, that we can respect each other. Yes. And we both have an open lifespan. We both make our own decisions about how long we live, yeah. when we live, when we don't live. 
and yeah, we can live or not live in harmony together. I would love, I would, I would love for the world to work like that. But the thing that I'm then, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then, then I'm worried. I'm worried. Yeah. <laughs> Don't think of it. Don't think of it. <laughs> okay, uh, a, f a few things. First, first, and most important, people said it already, but okay, there is no obligation to live uh, forever. Eh? Yeah. And personally, I want to live as long as I want to live, you know. Yeah, but I mean, at the moment, I don't have any choice, you know, I'm 61 years old and statistically I will be uh, dead in about 20 years and there is absolutely no chance I'm going to be here in 53 years, given the uh, actual situation. Okay, and the real reason we are, uh, there are people saying they are not afraid to die, the real reason is called terror management uh, theory or mortality salience uh, or uh, Stockholm syndrome and so on. The fact that we know that we are, well, the only, the main reason, the fact that we know that we are going to die and that it is that we don't have any way to escape it and that it is in an awful way losing almost uh, everything and that it's going to happen to your parents, to your children, to the people you love and even to the people you hate mm -hmm. uh, and that you, even for the people you hate, you probably would not choose this if it was possible for them to avoid it. So that's that's why, that's why we are uh, uh, telling us uh, stories since uh, uh, when the, the uh, animals were, were still speaking, uh, <laughs> like uh, Dutch speaking people say. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's, the, that's the reason. But w once again, the goal is not uh, immortality, the goal is immortality. This means uh, in the relatively short term to be able to live without senescence and this means uh, in a longer term to be able to avoid uh, all forms of death that we do not want. Yeah, and I think I understand that now a, a lot better than I did before I walked in here. My, my main concern with this notion of being able to choose how long you live, if you want to opt in or out or come back, um, is, is, and what I hear a little bit in the, in the things I've heard is there's these um, solutions and assumptions uh, of things that we are not able to do now. So, yes, I would love to live in a world where there is a freedom to choose how long you stay alive. And there is this sense of freedom. If there is an uh, authentic experience where I get to decide what I want to do. But it doesn't exist in the world I live in now. I have only partial um, bodily, um, who, what do you call it, um, autonomy. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of things that are decided for me. And if I, uh, for instance, um, well, again, if you, I was going to make a, 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 a vergelijking. What's the word? Comparison. Comparison, thank you. <laughs> Uh, with Alzheimer, but if we can cure that, then I'd be able to make my own life's end choice. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. So there is it. Okay, yeah, okay. Well, mm -hmm. well I, have to, I have to go back to the drawing board. No, it's, it's interesting. I think it's for a lot of people this, this a sense of death that you cannot choose yourself is essential to our human experience. And this is something that is being, right now it is. And that's why I think the resistance, and that might be the point I'm trying to make, that's why there's a lot of resistance from the general public. Because you, uh, this group of people is talking about things that are um, changing the, the essence of how a lot of people uh, view their own humanity. Um, and we are, coded not to trust this. We have seen it not work. We have talked about Freiwillig uh, Lebenseinde. Anyone know the English version of that? Like the choosing of your own time and death. And it doesn't happen in this world. There's so much struggle with it. So, in this field, 
I think that would be very interesting because you, and that's, I spoke to uh, about this during the lunch as well, I hear you all talk about uh, these um, techniques and this, but it's all very philosophically based in what it is like to be human. And I think there's that you you all are doing that. It's part of this process as well. And it's much more than just transhumanism. It's much more than just AI. It's how do we approach this? And how much humanity do we take along? What do you mean by humanity? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is the question. Mm -hmm. That is the core question of this. What is humanity? So if we are afraid of this AI taking over, I don't know, none of you are afraid of that, but in general, if we're afraid of AI taking over, um, it, it cannot take over if it does have a moral sense. You know, if, if it has, a, I, I call it morality, it might not be the best word of it, but if it has this human attribute of questioning why, why do I do something? And an AI, like why? Do I do this? Why do I want to live side by side with humans? And why do I not want to take them over? Well, isn't the goal to gain wisdom? If, if you look at what is the, the fact of the essence of humanity is to be humane. And you mentioned love, you mentioned glass. Mm -hmm. you, it was very beautiful how you put these words together. Mm -hmm. But if the core question is, what is human? What are we? So let's focus on that and, and see if we can find a consensus because really this essence or X factor doesn't make sense to me. Um, what I strive for is to be a more humane being. Yeah. And it's that what is there's a difference between humanity and humaneness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being yeah. humane. Mm -hmm. I don't know that many humaneness this is around the world. Today. Then I think that's the There's distinction that I'm trying to make. Yeah. Indeed, it's more humane than humanity. Yeah. And the question, what is humane, is of course bigger than transhumanism. But I think uh, the field you are working in touches this so essentially um, that the responsibility is bigger than just transhumanism. It, it well, is. I think most of us know that. So, Andrew, you had a question. Could you go ahead? Well, I think it's yeah. been okay. Sorry. okay, so uh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know if this is the position you take, but it's a position I have heard uh, over and over again over the years, and that is people who say uh, death gives meaning to life. Mm -hmm. Is that a position you take or not take? I'm not taking any position, okay, by okay, the way. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. I'm not taking any. No, um, it is, I think, um, what has been true for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And even though uh, a different approach is required and needed, it is still the way our society functions. And I think that is um, the point I'm trying to get across. Um, don't get lost. Be aware. Take us along for the ride. Because I think as, as non-scientific, sort of not active in this research, um, we have these questions as well. They're the same questions we all have, but then transhumanism actually does it with a focus on the future with all the technologies we have. It's, it's talking about environment, it's talk about equality. These are things that are not present in our current human society. Mm -hmm. So how do we know we can project them into the future? So it, it comes down to this question, and that, that's the question I kind of want to give to you how to be human, what makes it humane, which I think is indeed a better word than humanity, but what is humane? And how can you make an AI humane? AI humane? Okay, Next so question. I was actually going to then defeat my own uh, oh, no. question, <laughs> in the sense that was the whole goal, uh, and that is that what I always see, and you, know, you are an artist, so this is a perfect metaphor to use here, is that uh, imagine you create a beautiful piece of art, Right? Is its value of the artwork then in the fact that it only exists for a limited period of time? Wouldn't it be extremely sad if we never saw uh, the David from Michelangelo, for example, because it was destroyed? Right? Yeah. So, 
I, I will say that the finitude of something does not give meaning to it. The, the meaning of an artwork is in the fact that it makes people feel things, that it you know, makes people think about things. It's the experience. And, yes, and that can go on forever, right? So you can have an artwork that thousands of years later still brings up questions, still inspires people, still brings up emotions into people, right? So the finitude is not something that gives a meaning. And I think the same applies to human life. The finitude of our life does not give any meaning to our life. No, but what does then give this meaning? It's the ability to do things. It's the ability to, for example, improve the world, yeah. to go out and make things better, to so, do things, so to, to make experience a, things. A personal I choice in. So the I is essential to Humanity? The eye is absolutely essential into your own, you give yourself your, your own life meaning. Yeah. It's you who gives your own life meaning by the choices you make, by the things you do. Yes. That gives meaning to your life. And I mean, we all should do that in a sense, and then we work together in a sense as a community. We, we, we come together as a, as a community with people who have shared ideas shared um, um, hopes and ambitions and, and goals and, and inspire each other and so on. Yeah. That's, I think, the meaning. The meaning of life is other people. <laughs> um, we have to wrap up soon, but we have some maybe two minutes for some final words. Okay, I'm gonna try to be quick. So yes. you got in a lot of pushback about uh, death, etc. But I think you got mm. one thing super right. Can you but can you step away <laughs> from the speaker? Step away oh, from the speaker, yeah. please. Oh, oh. Yeah. I'm trying to be on stage. <laughs> so I think you got one thing super right that many people fail at noticing about transhumanism, yeah. and that we're not perfectionists. Uh, there is a lot of imperfections in the world and even if we enhance and fix a lot of stuff, we're gonna just end up with even more. I've been struggling with various web pages and apps on my phone, part of my extended mind, and so on and so on. Yet, that's an enhancement. And I think the beauty of your uh, 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 talk, poem, I don't know what to call it, which is also quite fun, is that it gets this plurality of the futures we're aiming for. We're searching for this labyrinth of possibilities, all that broken glass and trees and other interesting things, where some of them are hiding enormous beauty. They are. And I think that's, the, that's, that's what I find. If we, have, if we have this imperfection, if we have these quests, and we keep in the back of our mind this moral, humane, uh, way of living, then it can only come to the techniques. You know, it can only disappear into the AI, in the biases. If we give it good biases, you know, instead of the wrong ones, there is uh, there's a huge potential for actual um, human evolution, the good way. Finally, I mean, <laughs> the good kind of evolution. The good kind of evolution, please. <laughs> Exactly. All right, we have to wrap up sadly because of time, but thank you so much, Vita.